Hi everyone, I'm Jared Neuner. I'm with Crane Worldwide Logistics and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we approach developer experience uh, building on top of the modern data stack at our organization. So maybe another way to think about the framing of this talk is really like how we approach data platform as a product internal to our own data team, right? So with ourselves as customers to some degree. So I think it's extremely useful, especially when you're dealing um, with a highly paid team that has a lot of expectations on them, right? Like most uh, data teams are to really treat your platform as a product. And so one tenant of that, right, is that your core customers are gonna be actual developers, right? Which comes with both some advantages and disadvantages, right? One of the advantages being that that means that most of your core customers are pretty technical. Um, I think, you know, if you look at, uh, hopefully in still a humanizing way, if you look at your team as like a very um, costly uh, and well-trained set of resources, right? Then you wanna maximize throughput. And really that comes down to optimizing for developer experience. And I think it also has a nice side benefit, right? Of creating an environment where we all wanna work and we all have the tools that we like, right? So it um, helps with, just like everything uh, around the team from cohesion to morale to hiring. Uh, if you invest time in optimizing for developer experience and then it has that really nice side effect of the team is able to deliver a lot more, a lot more rapidly, right? So you get happiness and productivity from treating your own tools and really how they mesh together like products, right? We've already got um, several layers of product managers in the actual, uh, you know, like SaaS tool making organizations worrying about our developer experience but then it's incumbent on us as either like internal product managers or just engineers and analytics engineers and everything else um, to optimize for that experience there. And so when you optimize for developer experience, you get a couple key benefits that I don't think uh, will be too controversial here. So one of them is encourages iteration. I think the best example I have for this is that if it's gonna be a long drawn out process to update that one line of incorrect documentation in your DBT docs, or to fix that one um, tiny error in some SQL somewhere, people will generally avoid it, right? So you make it really easy for people to iterate on small things and to fix bugs and all those other, other things, right? So that means a smooth workflow end to end. If it's gonna take you an hour to fix a minor bug, then that's how you just build up a giant backlog of bugs. If it's gonna take you an hour to implement some small optimization, right? Then a lot of times people just pass over it. Um, and so just kind of like another thing to um, that is gonna, not going to be controversial here, right, is what people are referring to as a modern data stack is pretty fragmented at this point. And uh, I'll just take this one moment to say that uh, it's kind of disconcerting when people actually call it the modern data stack because, you know, it's batch based and the experience isn't really that coherent. And what are we going to call it five years from now? So really, whenever I say MDS in my mind, I'm thinking like modular data stack, and that's something that an approach of like kind of, you know, stitching together best of breed tools into a single platform experience, or I think, you know, we can maybe stick with internally, right? We'll stick with that moniker, but you, so you guys can think modern data stack, but in my own head, I'm saying modular just because it makes you uncomfortable to call it modern. Um, and so anyways, that fragmentation, right? You get a poor end to end developer experience out of the box. If, and depending on the team, right? You may have already experienced this, right? If you've got, seven tabs open, um, plus like a couple of different console windows, your IDE or whatever, right? The, the number of times that you're like alt tabbing or like switching between uh, various tools, just like each one of those like tiny context switches adds friction and kind of exhaust people for small tasks to some degree. Um, but I just wanna bring up before we kind of dive into some more of the details about our team context and how we approach this, uh, if you're going to be treating something as a product, you can't forget to actually talk to your users. Be like, it's, I, I do need to say it out loud, but it's probably obvious to all of you. And it's really helpful to actually map out, and not just map out, but like follow user journeys. So for example, if it's maybe been, um, if you're not the person doing a specific type of hands-on work, but you think you know how it should be constructed, right? So kind of like looking at you, all the managers who made you know, kind of like your career as individual practitioners. And now it's been somewhere between, you know, six months and a few years since you've really taken on a large end-to-end -end project on your own. You really want to watch your own teammates 
go through their user journeys on this platform and make sure that it makes sense. And the other thing, right, just uh, shouldn't need to say it to a lot of data people, but I feel like I do is that you have to actually measure usage, right? And ideally, if you can measure, measure usage in context where you can see people are like literally abandoning user journeys, like for example, PRs that get open that like never get completed um, is actually kind of like a little bit analogous to like card abandonment and stuff like that. If the reason they're abandoning is like, oh, I just didn't want to figure out how to get all these tests to pass or whatever. So yeah, so a little bit about our company context and then we'll talk about uh, kind of how that fits into our team structure and how we think about these things. And I'll give a couple examples of how we address kind of developer experience um, issues with like a modular or modern data stack approach. So work for Crane, we're a logistics company. Um, so we ship and warehouse things. We do a lot more than that, but I think for a um, audience focused on the technology, that's enough context, right? Um, so we have a diverse set of supporting services around uh, all of our logistics activity. Plus we have truly, you know, global six continent um, operations. And so that means we have a relatively complex source system environment um, just because of that dispersion of services and operations. Um, and then our data team headcount is about 0.3% uh, of like the total company. So not necessarily uh, super large, and we're definitely still in the uh, growth phase as we take over all the responsibilities that really like a large company data team should be able to, to handle effectively, right? So we're still, you know, I'd say, um, a little bit lower on the maturity curve uh, than we would like to be, which is probably the story of every data team everywhere. I don't think I've talked to any other data team leads who are happy with where they're at. Um, but so one of the core concepts that ties into how we approach our data platform as a product is that we really treat the data engineering role as a tool maker role. Um, and so if you look at how our team is split out, right? So we've got a really clear uh, data engineering vertical. And then today, and this won't be true forever, but business intelligence and analytics engineering overlap on the same team. As a matter of fact, part of our core platform experience is empowering uh, BI developers and BI engineers to own everything end to end from raw data through the data warehouse out to you know, user facing outputs and data apps. And then today we are already starting uh, spinning up separate data pods that kind of match with domains. Um, so nothing too, I think, crazy there either. But so if we zoom in on the data engineering role, right, because they're the people delivering the platform, they have a really clear data platform focus. And they do have that additional responsibility that someone has to handle of landing raw data, right? So those aren't two separate responsibilities, at least yet. Um, and then they also, most importantly, own the developer experience, uptime, and observability of the whole platform uh, end to end. And so uh, just a side comment on, you know, so these are actually two relatively important jobs, right? So a side comment on the owning of landing raw data um, essentially we make that a pretty low effort job by we have like a small, we focus on the developer experience of data engineers themselves first uh, for raw data pipelines. And so we have like a small set of highly automated uh, clear patterns for how we get data in. Um, so it's, it's less of a concern than it might be in other environments. Uh, and then everyone else, just for the purpose of this talk, obviously it's a um, diverse, uh, and complicated landscape in terms of like who is using that platform and publishing things on it. But just for the purpose of this, right, everyone else is building on or consuming from the platform, right? So the data engineers, we actually, I think, ask a lot of data engineers in our organization and that they get to have a lot of fun because they're very focused on platform and capability. But then they also have to have that, to some degree, that product manager hat on, right? So over time, as it grows in order, sure those responsibilities are kind of naturally like split out, people get more specialized. But today our data engineers have gotten quite good at basically being product managers for the platform itself. So just some more context setting, I'm not gonna belabor this and I'm not gonna pretend that um, this is like the most well uh, thought out framework here, but just to kind of put us in context, like hey, what are some of the functions 
actually being fulfilled when I talk about platform because realize not everyone has the same biases I do around how their stack is set up and what their team does. So really talking about so data capture and transport, right? So things like CDC or you know loading data out of source systems or capturing data from third parties. Transformation and processing, right? So how do you like clean and convert raw data into the format that you need for building products on the downstream, whether the product is the data itself or something it just like reads from or uses that data. We've got actual consumption and serving, um, which is you know, the important part where you actually get value out of things. And then orchestration automation, which is really, I think, a large part of the focus of this summit. And so just like kind of, I'm actually going to leave out a few logos here. So like look at our modern data stack. Uh, there, there are a decent number of logos. I got a couple of things on here twice where like, you know, we use Snowflake and Python and stuff in multiple places. Um, but I'm not going to go into any of these specifics. Someone wants to like talk stacks or tool selection because we've done a lot of tool selection over the last 12 months. Happy to do that uh, in the Q&A or one-on-one -on -one after. Um, but just you know, trying to emphasize like, hey, there are a lot of different touch points, transition points, state changes, whatever uh, going on in our stack, right? We don't. So for both good and bad reasons, right? We do not have the experience where we, you know, log into Ascend and that's where everything's happening. Just for a little shout out to the uh, sponsors here. So let's talk through a few trade-offs. I won't dwell on these because again, I don't think this is super controversial. You can probably find a dozen blog posts about you know, the problems associated with bundling and unblending or however you want to, uh, to frame those. So we get a customized to purpose stack, right? All of our tools are fit for purpose, uh, but we've gotten some pretty, so happy, happy face, right? But we've gotten some pretty clear feedback on tool overload for new team members. So I almost have to kind of like, especially for people in hybrid roles, we have to like pace them um, into just getting comfortable with all the different uh, little sub segments of our stack. And you know, people who have worked in like say a software engineering space where they've already had to deal with a ton of specialized tools we tend to adapt to that uh, more easily than say someone who's like coming from a business and domain analytics focus uh, and is used to you know maybe having uh, a smaller tool set. And the reason I bring that up is because actually the throughput that we often want to optimize for is for people at the right hand side of kind of like that delivery pipeline, right? So people who have less experience with the diversity of tools and are a little bit less technical, the people whose throughput delivers the most value um, in your end game. And so um, it's actually the tool overload issue happens right where you don't want it to. Uh, so we get to choose best of breed tools, right? So kind of like similar, but um, happy also. But then evaluation, you kind of you just have to like pick a cutoff, right? In terms of how much effort and energy you're willing to put into tool evaluation, you have to maybe accept a little bit of um, modern data stack FOMO, right? Where you've got uh, new people posting about in DBT Slack you know, new tools every week or whatever, and you have to like set really clear criteria, have a pretty structured process. Anyway, it's just by having you know so many options to choose from and so many uh, vertical slots to fit options into, right? Where you're not just choosing one all-in platform, choosing all these different components to meet specific needs. Um, so it kind of like for forces you to be intentional thinking about boundaries between functions and also you have to put more effort in the selection. And so then we don't have single vendor lock-in, which for me is a huge advantage. I think anyone who's like suffered through a big migration effort, especially off of more centralized uh, platforms that fulfill multiple functions, um, that's a strong motivator. Uh, if you've ever been part of like a you know 18 month migration effort um, that left a lot of you know, kind of bodies on the trail. Um, but then we also have a good dozen vendor relationship and inter relationships and enterprise agreements to deal with. And the other part then is that, okay, so we were able to match cost to use at a pretty granular level. However, total cost is then completely obscured unless you bring those costs together um, into a, a unified kind of like management plane to expose that to both developers and people who have to sign off on budgets or manage their budgets. Someone's not very fun to it. So now let's talk about how we think about, let's get to the maybe more interesting part for most of you, right? So let's talk about how we 
uh, as an organization or data organization think about mitigating some of these problems. And then we'll zoom in on one of those, mainly because it matches the theme of the conference. So one of the like first lines of defense here is good docs, right? So by good docs, I mean um, essentially kind of like introductory run books or whatever your equivalent to Lean videos is for like how to do uh, basic workflows, right? Just make it really easy for people who say like aren't familiar with um, DBT, like just like knock it out in the readme for that part of your uh, repo or for that however you're structured, right? Make it really easy for people to um, come on, know who to talk to, where to find more info, how to get started for this specific environment setup, right? And then the other part of this is I think going back to selection, you want to save any documentation that comes out of your selection, whether it's like GitHub discussions or you like wrote, you know, a really nice write up for your boss about why you should spend uh, however many dollars on Snowflake instead of a different alternative. And you save those, right? And it, what's interesting is to me, normally I wouldn't be like as interested in those, maybe just like a, a personal thing. Where I'd rather like talk through it with people, but I've had, we've had a decent, decent number of people on the team ask to see those specific docs. Like, hey, whenever you guys pick Snowflake, for example, do you have documentation left over from that? So we've seen some value in that. It helps people orient um, and get started faster. Um, the other part is that you know, going back to what I said before about observing actual workflows, it's important not to just do that one time up front when you're like trying to select tools to meet a legitimate gap in workflow or just like standing up you know, some layer of your stack for the very first time. You need to revisit this occasionally. And I think here's a uh, key and not like hack, but just um, tenant to focus on for this is you want to streamline by role, right? So if your stack is fragmented, there's an argument to be made that that's not necessarily a problem so long as the individual swim lanes, right, which are usually segregated by specific job roles, especially if you try and create like a vertically integrated team um, where people can own their workflows end to end as much as possible, um, then so long as you streamline by role, right? Then that means your day-to-day -day work is going to be okay, right? And then you also want to have unified management layers over that. There are other concerns. I think streamlining by role is important. So kind of tying to what I was saying um, before about like, don't just observe workflows up front, like watch how people are interacting with the stack over time. Just this constant hunt for friction, right? So like you kind of start to uh, like tune your kind of like product management years to like when someone mentions something that indicates that they're abandoning a really highly productive workflow because of a little bit of friction earlier or whatever. So I won't go too much of that. And another key one um, that I think probably most of us need to like repeat to into the mirror uh, at the start of each day for anyone who has kind of like tool selection or budget authority over a data team and um, actively enjoys their work and keeps up with the space uh, is probably to just be absolutely ruthless about saying no to new tools unless you actually need them and to actively turn off or cancel tools that either aren't doing their job or just aren't adding enough value. So I won't harp on that one, but it's just like the easiest way to solve the fragmentation problem is to just decide you don't even need that solution in your stack. And so tying into that above is, and this one I think people have mixed feelings on and it certainly ties to the uh, maturity of your data organization but limiting options and creating hubs, and I think these go hand in hand. So I'll give an example. You can say, no polyglot data storage and compute. We will only let you surface corporate data sets on Snowflake, and you are gonna do all your transforms in DBT, right? And so there are obviously a lot of times where you wanna break out of those restrictions. I think the more that you can limit options within reason, right, to good options that cover everyone's needs, then the happier you'll be, right? So imagine if like you could have one environment where everyone just standardizes on Snowflake or BigQuery, you have another where it's like, oh yeah, pick either one, no big deal, right? You've like created this unnecessary split just in where things could live. Um, and so the more that you can, especially once you start splitting people off into like pods or the main groups or whatever form of decentralization you favor, um, the more that you can create hubs by like limiting options, at least around key interface, uh, not interfaces, but yeah, really around key like integration points, um, you're going to see some benefits there. And so I think one place, just as a side note on 
that before moving on is really that um, I think one place to have a good polyglot representation is probably a consumption layer, right? Like if you've got a really well-structured data warehouse, for example, I'm like sure, let people connect with whatever tools they want. So anyway, so you got my um, side philosophy around intentionally uh, eliminating options and standardizing. And so anyways, and then the last mitigation over this, right, which actually I'm just gonna point out is, it's really kind of like your option of last resort, right? Like you should have a good onboarding and training process for people to use the tools that they need. You should be constantly trying to optimize the workflows. You should say no to tools you don't need. You should limit your options so that there's just like coherency by default across your stack. And then the final option, but is very necessary, you can't get away from it, is just to automate, right? And so you know, it's um, almost a tautology here to say that like, hey, we're gonna use automation as glue across our stack. Uh, and maybe one other way that I think about this, right, is that like, I think CI CD pipelines are kind of like a love language for your development team. <laughs> so um, well-structured ones that run quickly and deliver the value you need. So we'll talk about a few key areas to automate, and I'll give you some examples of exact things that we automate today, just as like ideas for where you could start similar things on your own teams. Um, I think some of which won't be shocking, right? But as a, a collective uh, set of automations, like make a big difference in how quickly we operate day to day. Um, so just like thinking about, again, there are a million different ways you can slice this. This is just one. I encourage you to apply different uh, filters and heuristics whenever you're thinking about where and how you need to automate, right? So think about automating our development processes. Think about automating review and validation. Actually, this one I think is really important. Um, we at our, on our own team had some early on challenges where uh, just how about this, most people on this call who have worked on an engineering team before have probably experienced like the PR that's waiting on a reviewer for days or weeks or months, when in reality, you want that feedback loop to be like less than a day, an afternoon, immediate would be even better, right? So you make that a really low friction process for the reviewer and for the submitter to get through review and validation. Um, I'm just assuming, right, that all of us are on the same page about like if the things going to production past a certain point of maturity, you probably get at least one reviewer. Um, but maybe not everyone agrees with that. Uh, and then deployment, I think that one, there's probably very little argument, I'm guessing, from our audience there. Uh, and monitoring as well, right? And I think when I'm talking about automation for monitoring, it's just there's a, you know, there's a certain level of misery when you like are hopping from, you know, like imagine the, Kind of like worst case where you have something break and then you're like kind of hopping down the like chain of dependencies and like SSHing into a different um, box or getting a prompt on you know, like a running pod or container or whatever for each like step in the process and then like gripping a bunch of logs, right? So there's like some level of automation and consolidation around monitoring that people really want, right? Um, and again, I'm going to focus on per role workflows, right? Because it's people's People have a specific job to be done that lines up with certain personas and roles in our data team. And you don't want to make things just easy for part of it because then you'll get workflows that stall out or you'll get work in progress that kind of like stacks up. You want to focus on the end to end workflow as much as you can. So I just, all I'm going to do here is I'm not going to belabor any of these. I'll try and go through relatively quickly. I just, here are some things that we automate for development. It's not a complete list. Um, so low boilerplate transport, but by this, I'm actually referring back to how we um, optimize data engineering time, right, for landing new raw data. So we've been really careful about establishing a set of patterns um, for like anything that we need to do custom, as well as adopting uh, a really good managed change data capture tool so that we're not like redefining schemas in multiple places or whatever for us. Adding something new from a raw source is like a one day event. Uh, so on, most of the time is spent getting permissions uh, sorted out, right? If you need to add a new table from a source system, we can be deployed and have that live in a matter of minutes, right? So we've invested time in automating away some of the painful parts of data engineering development. It's not um, really a huge focus, right? Because it's a less rapidly changing uh, part of our stack. 
we bootstrap local dev environments through dev containers. Everyone gets the exact same thing. All you do is open it up in VS Code, you build, make sure there's a clean sandbox for every branch. No one's manually spinning that up. It just appears for them. Um, same thing with like testing and checks. I'm pretty sure there's some pre-commit checks that like, and some individuals on our team like don't even know what it's checking and they don't care so long as it doesn't fail, right? So it really helps us with quality and people aren't thinking about things like how to format, right? They already know that like Black's gonna run on all of your Python code and it's gonna fix your format, it suggests formatting fixes um, and fail your commit if it didn't trigger when it was auto-saving for you before. Um, and then we run full tests on every push. I mean, this is like some of this, you know, be sitting like, oh yeah, that's like just basic software engineering stuff. But there are a lot of data teams, I think today who this kind of thing accelerates development. And the key part is like having people not think about the different links between the components of the stack and just like automate that away. Um, and we do, of course we automate like provisioning and everything for compute, right? You don't want analytics engineer um, thinking about uh, how you're setting some of that stuff up, right? They should have visibility into it. Um, we don't we don't lock away parts of our stack from different personas, uh, but we just try and organize it so that again by role, as long as you're staying within the swim lane of that role, you're good to go. And if you want to look outside your own swim lane, everyone has basically a complete visibility at a minimum, right? And you can open a PR for anything into any other domain's concern, but. Uh, so then review and validation, I actually will spend a little bit of extra time on this one because I think it's super important, right? So every PR that get requested to review is going to have a completely separated, completely clean um, test environment that gets built. Just for anyone wondering, like, yes, we do our DBT builds incrementally differing the production. Um, but so this includes things like our orchestration, we'll like deploy to branch specific projects. Um, everything is like ready and built in pretty close. To it. It's not a uh, perfect separation, but I'd say like 95% clean room environment. So it means that as a reviewer, you don't have to reproduce anything. It's already been reproduced for you exactly as it would be deployed. Then we have PR checklist for reviewers, a little bit of human automation. It's a very useful one we found. I won't dwell on it, um, but you can see why having like kind of a quality checklist for what the reviewers expect to do on different types of PRs is useful. And then one of the biggest ones is that we diff both uh, data and code. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to like call out specific vendors here, but since I've already mentioned like DBT, I'll just call it like, there are ways to do this yourself, but this is essentially the main problem that Datafold originally tackled. And we've had really good luck, um, not good luck, but really good results building them into our process uh, for this exact reason. And that as a reviewer, our my primary concerns are like, how is especially if you're talking about like say at the data warehouse layer, like how are my data models changing? So I wanna see an exact diff of like, hey, how are our schemas changing? And I wanna be able to go in and zoom out, like give me some examples of where values have changed. You can build stuff like that on top of like, um, you know, there are a couple like good packages out there for like audit or you could like write your own comparisons um, or just, you know, select from accept. Uh, but however you do it, we do this automatically, right? You can just, uh, there's nothing to trigger. It just populates in your PR and your reviewers to use exactly what's being changed. And another thing that we um, put in there is we just put in um, static security analysis and secret scanning so that like people aren't reviewing things with an eye to security as much as like we, I mean, it's still expected that you're looking at these things during that PR, but you get a lot of those things automatically improved for you across our whole code base. Um, and then actually another one, which is, this is an example of like the kind of small things that you can add that will um, improve developer quality of life. It's like one click repo visualization. So you'll like stay oriented. It's just like one click to run a quick workflow, quick workflow. It'll pull up a visualization of a whole repo so you can like stay oriented on what's happening. Um, and then on the deployment side, I won't dig into this because this is where I suspect most people on this call, right, already have a lot of stuff on their own, right? But we automate everything around all the deployment of our stack other than that, I'll just like call it a specific example. We like, if we're applying stuff to our Snowflake Terraform config, then we usually run those as human beings. Um, automate our document um, docs deployment. Um, and we have like really clear rules for how like, hey, as soon as it's on master, then like what's 
the matching representation in the data warehouse will be updated under these conditions. Uh, and then I'll just uh, very quickly comment on a few things I think would be really useful to automate through to tie things end to end in the future. Um, one is around contract and version management for consumers, which I have a lot of downstream consumers who need more of like a microservices style um, contract enforcement and versioning. Uh, and then another actually really big one for stitching together all those parts of the stack is around automated incident updates and placing those essentially like in lineage for different data sets. And so what I mean by that is, you know, imagine that you see an error on the dashboard and then we've all had that moment where we either like start it, we start at either the left or right end of that whole like data supply chain. And you work either backwards or forwards, checking each component and see if it's correct. Or maybe you bisect the chain, whatever you do, whatever your strategy is. Or maybe you just guess and check different parts based on intuition. You can waste a lot of time that way. And we've noticed that we've like reached the size of the team or occasionally things will be say like, we'll have a minor hiccup on, uh, there'll be a backup on propagating CDC changes and someone will waste time troubleshooting a dashboard when really it'd be ideal to just automatically, as soon as we missed that original SLA, um, which hit, hit a data engineer, but didn't necessarily notify someone who's building BI dashboards that hey, like everything downstream of this, depending on this data set is temporarily broken. So don't even bother troubleshooting because we already know what the problem is. So I think that's actually kind of like that end-to-end -end visibility for the health of your data supply chain is a really important piece of automating across you know, all these different concerns. And there's other a lot of other stuff I haven't touched on here, like you know, I mentioned earlier, um, cost visibility and exposing that to uh, various people. But these are just like some ideas for like things you can start on that might even seem like they're in isolation, right? But like the action that when your DBT project updates, redeploys your um, orchestration jobs so that they're picking up from the most recent commit or whatever, um, that kind of stuff, you know, it um, prevents people from chopping up their workflow with this like kind of solo chair integrations or just flipping between tabs or whatever. So now I'm gonna uh, just go to the live Q&A and thanks for sticking around and listening.